sits on a throne unto the Lamb. Blessings and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Well, get your Bibles and um, turn with me over to Psalms chapter 150. The text says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. You got any breath in you this morning? Come on, let's praise him. Hallelujah. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. How many know it's important to have a good attitude? It's important to have a pleasant personality. How many would agree with that? I mean, know that um, attitudes are contagious. Have you ever been at a function or you've been in a meeting and you go in there with the right attitude and next thing you know, you leave out with a bad attitude? Because one or two people had a bad attitude and it caused you to have a bad attitude or you had a bad attitude interrupt off on somebody else. <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's good to have a good attitude. I mean, you know that personality is a gift. Everybody don't know how to be grateful and thankful. I got one or two amens. I was grown, saved, filled with the Holy Ghost and the power of God, preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ before I embraced the fact that I had a bad attitude. Okay. I'll pick that up. Some of you are saying, dude, you still have a bad attitude. <laughs> okay, I won't debate that. But I will say this, the difference between me and some other Christians is the fact that I am aware of the fact that my attitude had to change. Come on, give God some praise. I know that people are turned away and turned off by people with a bad attitude. I mean, you know, people don't like to be around folks who are sour and complaining and always irritated and always finding fault and problems. But how many know that an attitude is a learned behavior? Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, your attitude was learned. A bad attitude is learned behavior. If you were raised by somebody who acted out on their moves in front of you, then it teaches you how to, how to, how to act. How I many know that you don't always have to act the way you feel? Right. Amen. Amen, somebody. It took me years to learn that. It took me years to realize that just because I felt a certain way, I didn't have to act out based on how I felt. Amen, somebody. Now, why y'all upset? I'm talking about me. <laughs> y'all looking at me like I'm picking on you. I'm talking about me. I was grown. I was saved. I was filled with the Holy Ghost. I was preaching about the goodness of Jesus. Until the Holy Ghost said, boy, you got to do something. With that attitude. Are so you talking to me? The Holy Ghost said, yeah, Absolutely. You can't be representing me walking around here with that attitude. Amen, somebody. I mean, you know, that attitude, a bad attitude affects your relationships. A bad attitude affects how you deal and how you discipline your children. Oh, it got quiet right then. 
A bad attitude affects your marriage. A bad attitude affects your paycheck. You know, there's a lot of people who are employed just because they have a good attitude. They're not the most productive. They're not the most competent. But the supervisor has made a calculated decision. I would rather come in here every day and work with someone who has an attitude, at least they are trying to mess it up. <laughs> then to come in here every day and live with somebody who knows what they're doing but have a bad attitude. <laughs> Talking about it ain't in that job description. Amen. 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 Some of you know what I'm talking about. Amen. I don't know if I should say this, but I'm going to say it anyway, so you don't feel like you're out there by yourself. I missed out on a promotion to be a manager, and uh, two levels up told me, he said, I can't put nobody under you. They said, you, you. You too rough. They said, your attitude. They would exit this place. He said, but then I can't afford to lose you. So I'm going to pay you the same salary. <laughs> but I'm just not going to put you with people. <laughs> I'm going to lock you in that corner and let you do what you do. But don't say nothing to nobody, Thompson. Keep your mouth shut, Thompson. What was he saying? He said, listen, your attitude will affect the whole environment. And some of us this morning, we don't realize it, that we are allowing our, our disposition, our attitudes to affect our atmosphere. Whether it's at the home, whether it's on the job, or whether it's in the church, or at the family reunion, or wherever you go, you're allowing your attitude to mess up your interaction with others. Let I me mean, know that you, the right attitude can open doors. People will bless you just because they like you. People will open doors because they like you. We got a loan on this church because the lady, the, 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 the vice president, liked us. I really think she liked that Pastor Ingrid. I don't know if she liked me or not. I saw, I kept looking at Pastor Ingrid. I think she liked Pastor Ingrid. But she said, she said, listen, we're going to get you the loan. Now, we hope you qualify for it, but she said, now, I'll tell you what. Her supervisor owed her a favor. And she said, if I got to pull that card out, I will. But she put her head down. She said, I just hope I don't have to use it. <laughs> but she did it because she liked us. She liked Pastor Ingrid. Attitude can open doors. It can shut doors. It can cause favor to flow into your life. It can stop favor from flowing into your life. Are you listening to me this morning? But here's the thing I want to dwell on this morning. And that is, when we as believers, we as Christians, when we allow ourselves to become negative, we lose our ability to have joy. We lose our ability to be thankful. We lose our ability to be grateful. David said this in Psalms 51 verse 12. David, he says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Now David is praying. And David's prayer is, Lord, restore back to me 
the joy of my salvation. That's a good prayer, but yet that is a, a tragic prayer because what David was saying was, I once had joy. My attitude at one time was good about my salvation with the Lord. My attitude at one time was very pleasant about being associated with God. But somehow, some kind of way, David was saying, I lost my joy. And so now he's on his knees and he's praying to God. He's saying, Lord, restore back to me the joy of my salvation. And some of us this morning, that ought to be our prayer. Lord, restore back to me the joy of my salvation. Just the pure joy of knowing that I am in relationship with a living God. Nothing has to be going right. Nothing has to be uh, 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 exactly how I need it to be. But just the fact that I know that I'm in relationship with the true and living God. That's enough to fill my heart with joy. Come on, somebody. And some of us have lost our ability to have joy. We have put joy on the back burner. I'm telling you this morning, don't allow the enemy to steal your life. There's nothing worse than being a Christian that's miserable in life. How many know that God did not call us to be miserable as Christians? Saved, heaven knows your name, on your way to, to glory, but miserable. How many know that it, that's the trick of the enemy to have you miserable? That's the trick of the enemy to have us frustrated and irritated. How many know that it is not God's will for us to be frustrated and irritated day in, day out, night, day out, day in, day, day, in, day out? God does not want us frustrated. He does not want us irritated. How many know that God wants us to have the joy of the Lord? Come on, somebody. How many know that life's supposed to be getting stronger and better as we age? Each day is supposed to be getting better. As you age in your walk with the Lord, as you mature in the things of God, as you learn more about him and the different facets of who he is, every day is supposed to be getting better and stronger. The Bible says it like this, that your latter days should be greater than your former days. How many believe that? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, let me do some, some foundational work here for a moment. Um, I mean, it, it's very difficult to maintain a certain level of expectation of God's word when you don't have joy. It's very difficult to maintain a, a certain level of faith of what God can do for you and do through you if your joy level is not up. Jesus, he told his disciples in John 16, verse 22, Jesus, he says, your joy, no man take it from you. And so we have to be careful that we don't allow man or the cares of this world to take our joy. Amen, somebody. Now watch this, you didn't come into this world with joy. But we all have had joy, and so if you don't have joy this morning, and you didn't come into the world with joy, but you did have joy, then what happened to it? Who took it? Or should I say, who have you surrendered your joy to? Because Jesus says, no man can take your joy. So what he's saying is, I'm in control of my joy. Can't no man come and take my joy. I have to surrender my joy. I had to surrender it through a negative attitude and how my perspective of how I see things and how I understand things to be. This is how I surrender my joy. Amen, somebody. We surrender our joy through bad news. I mean, you know that the world, when the world talks, it robs you of your joy. Amen, somebody. When the world, when, when they have a conversation, they're robbing you of your joy because all they're talking about is the negative. Amen. We lose our joy through circumstances. How I many know that it comes a point in your walk with God that you have to stop blaming yourself for things that you have absolutely no control 
over. Amen, somebody. A lot of us this morning, we're upset and we have lost our ability to have peace and have joy because we are concerned over something that we have absolutely no control over. Amen. It might be an unpleasant situation, but if you don't have any control about it or over it, what can you do about it? Okay, your, your, your child made a dumb mistake, but you don't have no control over it. All right, your finances are where they are, but you, there's nothing you can do about it. My mother used to say, boy, you can't get blood out of a turnip. I didn't understand it then. I, I kind of understand it now. But blood don't come out of a turnip, but, you know, I, I get the point. I mean, understand what I'm saying. We lose our joy through situations. I'm going to say something that I'm, I'm trusting you're going to hear me by the Spirit, and that is stop fighting over stuff that's not working in your life. Stop fighting over stuff that's not working in your life. If it's not working, don't fight over it. Let it go. It has an old saying that says that, you know what, it, 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 you can't ride a dead horse. If the horse is dead, dis, you know, dismount. What does it mean? Well, the, the saying, what it means is this, and that is that if it's not working, let it go. Jesus says it like this. Jesus, he was going through um, uh, 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 a territory, going through a region, and he saw some fig trees, and he was hungry, and it was time for the figs to be producing. There should have been figs. And Jesus goes to get figs. The fig tree had leaves, and so if there's leaves on the fig tree, there should be figs on the fig tree. And Jesus goes to get some figs because he's hungry, but there's no figs. And Jesus cursed the fig tree. And he comes back through, and the disciples are dismayed. They said, Jesus, the tree that you curse is, is, is dead. And what Jesus' point was, is, is very simple. He's saying, in essence, you know what? If it doesn't produce, lop it off. If it's not producing fruit, if it's not producing results, let that thing go. Why worry about something and lose your joy over something that's, that's not producing when it should be producing? Amen, somebody. Paul, the Apostle Paul, he says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Now, this is a powerful statement from Paul because Paul is under house arrest. He's incarcerated. He's got soldiers chained to him. But yet he's encouraging the church. He says, listen, rejoice in the, all, in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Paul said, don't be all bent out of shape about my chains. Get on with, with, the, with the gospel. Rejoice in the Lord is what he was saying. I love the way that the message translation puts it. The message translation says it like this. It says, celebrate God all day, every day. No, doesn't that sound good? Just celebrate God all day, every day. Because this is what we're doing when we're rejoicing in the Lord. We're celebrating his goodness. We're celebrating his, his faithfulness. We're celebrating who he is. We're rejoicing in the Lord. How are we rejoicing in the Lord? We're letting him know who he is, how awesome he is, how amazing he is, and what he means to us, and what he's done for us, and what we expect him to do. And how, him who sits on the throne, he's amazing, he's awesome, he's incredible. And so we're rejoicing in him. And as we rejoice in him, what are we doing? We're celebrating him. Come on, give God a praise, somebody. <laughs> Jesus says in John 14, 1, Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. In other words, Jesus was saying, it is my responsibility, it is your responsibility to stop trouble from getting into your heart. Now, that's a hard one. That's a hard one. That's, that's kind of difficult to do when you get bad news. 
that's kind of difficult to do when you're living a, 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 a living out a situation that's not favorable to you. That becomes challenging then. But yet, it's our responsibility, according to Jesus, to stop trouble from getting into our hearts. Come on, give him a praise, somebody. <laughs> but we can do it. Why? Because stress is not the will of God for us. Depression is not the will of God for us. Some of us this morning, if the truth be told, we, we, you are depressed. And I'm not trying to belittle that. I'm just simply saying that that is not God's will for you. That's not God's best for you. God does not want you depressed. He does not want you worried. He does not want you walking around like an emotional disrag. Hello, somebody. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. So the question then has to be, what does it really mean to have the joy of the Lord in your heart? You know, I, I throw that out, have the joy of the Lord, you'll be joyful always. But what does it really mean to have the joy of the Lord in your heart? Well, Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 lets us know that joy is a gift. It's a part of the fruit of the Spirit. Which means that as a believer, as a, a Christian, you can have the joy of the Lord overflowing in your life no matter what you might face, no matter what the circumstance, you have, I have the ability for the joy of the Lord to flow out of us in spite of what we see, in spite of what we may be experiencing. John uh, says it like this in 3 John chapter 1 verse 4, he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Now, this is a powerful statement because what Paul is saying here in essence is, I have joy based on what I know. I have joy based on my knowledge base. I have joy based on my comprehension of understanding of things. Christians that really have joy, Christians who really walk around and they, they express a true, pure joy of the Lord. It's not that they don't have problems. It's just that they have an understanding and they have a, a true perspective about the truth of their situation. Amen, somebody. They understand that in spite of what it looks like, in spite of what it sounds like, in spite of what it might be, they understand something and their perspective is different. And that is somehow, some way, at some time, at his choosing, God is going to turn this to my favor. It's not that they don't have problems. They just know that the God that they serve is greater than their problems. Greater than their circumstances. You know, I was putting this teaching together, and one face came to mind when I was dealing right here in this area and uh, sister uh sister donna y'all know sister donna i don't even know sister donna's last name i can't remember her, her last name huh there you go y'all know her that sister is always always filled with the joy of the lord and I know she had problems and challenges because I've, I've, I've talked to her, I've ministered to her. But even in the midst of communicating and talking about problems, she got a big old smile on her face. And every time you hear her on the prayer line, every time you interact with her, she is always <laughs> full of the joy of the Lord. She's so full of the joy of the Lord that if you don't know her, you think, you think she's fake. You think she's phony. But she's not fake, she's not phony. She's caught a hold of the fact that the joy of the Lord is her strength. And regardless of what she may experience in life, the God that she serves is greater. Come on, give God a praise. Now, here's the thing. Most believers, most Christians want the promises of God, but we don't want the process. We want the promises, but we don't want the process. How many know that the promises of God 
are conditional. It's a covenant. God says, if you do this, I'll do that. If you do this, I'll do that. And so the covenant is based on me doing something and God doing something. When God went to Abraham, he says, Abraham asked for me, this is what I'm going to do. And what was he saying? He said, I'm going to keep my part. I'm going to do my part of the covenant. Every promise of God in this text is based on us doing something. God has a part, and we have a part. I'm going to give you three simple steps to protecting the joy of the Lord in your life. Anybody interested? This is the first one. Psalms 33, verse 4, NIV translation, the text says, For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. First step is this. Remember God's faithfulness. Remember his faithfulness. The next time the enemy is trying to fool with your joy and mess up your joy level, Take a moment and just remember the faithfulness of God. He says, for the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. In other words, God is faithful. He is consistent. He's faithful. He is consistent. If you can't count on anybody else, you can count on God. Hallelujah. If you're going through a situation and people know that about your situation and that they're calling and say, you know, I'm going to be praying for you and, 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 and I'm going to pray for you. And people mean well and people will pray for you and they'll pray for you for a few days. But, you know, you may not stay in that situation long because people are going to move on. Hello. You ever ask somebody, I'm going to pray for you? Then they forget to pray for you? They ain't going to tell you that. Or they might pray for you for a minute and go on about their business. You might be in a struggle for a season. But you can have joy in the fact of knowing that you have a high priest that's seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you. And he's always making intercession for you. He's faithful to pray for you and to pray you through whether anybody prays for you or not. Come on, give him praise. There's been times I was going through a season and I was just frustrated and irritated and I'm just, just, just in a bad place. But what helped me get through was the fact that, you know what? God is watching out for me and Jesus is my intercessor praying me through. Amen, somebody. Come on, give him a praise. One of the most amazing stories to me in the text, and I say that in terms of, of the, the context of, 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 of the text and what God was really demonstrating through the teaching and through the story is the story about the three Hebrew boys. Y'all know that story? Where God uh, delivers them. They, they're thrown into the fire, into the fire, because they would not bow to Nebuchadnezzar. Amazing story. We know it. Now, what's amazing to me is the fact that God could have delivered them from the fire. But he didn't. Sometimes we read that story, we think, oh, this is just a nice little elementary story, but it, it's a true story. They refused to bow to another God. They stood on their principles and they stood with God. And because they stood with God, they were thrown into the, the fire, the, fire, the furnace of fire, the fiery furnace. And God could have, he could have 
deliver them or stop them from going into the fire. But he didn't. He took another route. He chose to get into the fire with them. And that lets us know a couple of things. And the first thing it lets us know is the fact that God not only reveals himself in bad situations, he reveals himself in good situations. He reveals himself in the good and the bad. We're so trained to see God and have joy when God brings us out of trouble. Not realizing that sometimes we can have the joy of the Lord because God may choose not to bring us out, but to hold our hand as we go through. There's been times in my life and I'm thinking, God, why, why is this door open and why am I going through this? And God's like, you know, just, just trust me. And all the way through that process, he's holding my hand. I don't lose my peace. <laughs> I don't get discouraged because I knew God had my hand. He could have stopped it. He could have delivered it. But he said, no, you're going to go through this one. Now watch this now. The test of joy is not always when we get out. I'm going to have joy because I got out. No, it's how we conduct ourselves when we're in bad situations. I'm in it. I don't like it, but it's good anyway. I'm in it. I don't like it, but I'm going to praise him anyway. Come on, somebody. Nehemiah says that joy is strength. I said, Nehemiah said that joy is strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So no matter what happens, I praise him. No matter what happens, I still trust him. Why? Because I understand something. I understand that if God don't deliver me, he will sustain me. Now, some of you got to get a hold of that this morning. You got to know that the God that you serve, if he does not deliver you, he will sustain you. Come on, give him a praise, somebody. So you respond with joy. You let the enemy know you're not going to get my joy. I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to badmouth God. I'm not going to badmouth the church. I'm not going to badmouth anybody. In this situation, in this season, if I say anything, it's going to be, God, I give you praise. I give you glory. I lift it for your holy name. Why? Because John said, I have no greater joy than knowing. It's the knowing that brings the joy. Now watch this. The third step is this. And that is, respond with gratitude. Now go to Psalms 100. I might start with verse 1. It says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, or he lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know he that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be unthankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Oh, hallelujah. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Into his courts with praise. Thanksgiving, praise. Thanksgiving, praise. When you look up thanksgiving and look at the word praise, 
And when you combine those three words, thanksgiving and praise, when you look them up in the concordance in the Bible, you come up with a total of 365. It's 365 days in a year. Every day we should have at least a thanksgiving or a praise on our lips. Come on, somebody. And then the third step is this. And that is remain surrendered. Now, watch what the text says. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. This is the Amplified. And this is the Apostle Paul. He says, let the same attitude and purpose and humble mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Let him be your example in humility. And how was Jesus our example? He made himself a servant and made himself of no reputation. In other words, he humbled himself to the cross. He humbled himself to be a servant for us. Paul has said we ought to say have the same attitude in humility. In other words, surrendering ourselves with the understanding that I am just a servant of God. And so no matter what I may encounter, no matter what may come my way, because I'm a servant of God, I'm not expecting anything that, um, uh, let me put it this way, nothing is, um, uh, I don't want to say this Holy Spirit, as a servant, uh, I can expect anything from anybody in any given situation. In other words, Jesus, he humbled himself as a servant, meaning that he, was, he, he put himself in a position to take on any situation, any person, or any circumstance by saying that because I humble myself, I give you permission to do whatever you want to do. So you can't hurt me. You can't harm me. Because I humble myself as a servant. I humble myself to take on whatever may come my way in my mindset. I humble myself. In other words, you can't get my joy because I anticipate the wrong coming my way. Hello, somebody. And because I anticipate it, I'm not going to allow it to hurt me. I'm not going to allow you to take my joy. I'm not going to allow my joy to be uh, uh, uprooted out of me because I position myself in a way that, you know what, I made up in my mind, it doesn't matter what happens, good or bad, I'm going to maintain a stance of humility and still give him praise. I don't know if I'm making sense right there. I mean, know that you can give folks permission to hurt you. And by giving them permission to hurt you, you take the sting out of the hurt. Hello, somebody. I'm out of here now. Help me, Holy Spirit. There are those who, who prepare in their decision process, they prepare for the worst case scenario. I'm one of those. In other words, I'm in a situation, this is the best I can anticipate, this is the worst that I can anticipate. And so I expect and prepare for the worst. I want the best, and I'm shooting for the best, but I prepare and I condition my heart and mind for the worst. Are you with me? So when the worst thing that could happen happens, I'm good. Because I prepared for that. But when the best thing that could happen happens, it's gravy. So what I've done in my decision-making process, I have planned out the surprise. I have taken away the sting of disappointment. I have removed all expectation of something higher than the low expectation. I don't know if that makes sense. When I make myself a servant, like Christ made himself a servant, then I come with the mindset of serving anybody and everybody. Hello, somebody. 
And so no matter how they may treat me or receive me, no matter how it may go, I'm good. Because I have positioned myself and humbled myself to be a servant like my Savior. Are you listening to me this morning? I have surrendered myself to the call of God and to his purposes. And so I recognize that whatever they did to Jesus, it could happen to me. Hello, somebody. Even when I try to be good, they might bite my hand. Even when I try to be a blessing, they might come back and say something different. Even when I, when I help them pay their bills, they might come back and say I did nothing. Hello, somebody. But it's okay. Because I've humbled myself to be a servant. I have surrendered myself. And so you can't get my joy. There's nothing you can do to take my joy. It's nothing for me to, it, it, I can't surrender my joy because I'm not anticipating. <sighs> nothing but the joy of the Lord. Uh, Paul says it like this. Let's see if I can get Paul to clear this up. Paul says in verse 17, NIV translation, Paul says, but even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. What Paul was saying is sometimes things happen in our lives that has nothing to do with us. Paul said, I'm being offered as a drink offering for you, but it's okay. I rejoice anyway. I rejoice for you. Paul is in this prison. He's chained up. He's saying, you know what? I've been offered up for you. But it's okay. I have joy anyway. He is saying there's times when things happen that have nothing to do with us. But he says, in essence, I make a, a, a decision of my will to rejoice anyway. This is what I mean when I say remain surrendered. You make a decision and you understand that there's things that may come your way that may happen to you that you have absolutely no, uh, um, uh, 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 it's not your fault, you had nothing to do with it, but you rejoice anyway. Come on, somebody. The Bible says, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice. And be glad in it. We disappoint God when we allow a day go by and we're not joyful. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice. David said, I trigger my will. I make a decision of my will. I will rejoice. It has nothing to do with what's going on in my life, whether good or bad. It has nothing to do with how I feel. No, I make a decision of my will with my faith to be joyful anyway. How many know that oftentimes we look for something to happen to affect how we feel? In other words, if something happens good, I'm happy, I'm joyful. If something happens bad, I'm disappointed, I'm upset. And oftentimes we look for something to happen good to determine whether or not we're gonna be joyful. But how many know that you can make a decision of your will to be joyful regardless of how you feel, and as you act out on that, on that faith level to be joyful, your emotions will follow that act. So, I can wake up Pastor Jackson, or I can go out here, let me put it like this, I can go out here, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna give you a, a, a personal example. A 
bought a new infinity. She laughing because she know. 2018, I bought that infinity. And in my mind, I'm only going to drive it certain places, keep it clean, keep it washed up. Okay? Hold on to that newness. Pastor Inga wasn't having it. She's like, I'm driving this. She said she didn't have a car. She had a car. She said, I ain't driving that car. I ain't driving that little car. Anyway, she starts driving it. And uh, she's driving the car and maintaining the car. Everything's good. Not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago. Now, my point is this. I, I'm trying to, I'm, my point is, I'm, I'm trying to keep her from messing up the car. Keep the newness on the car. It's a new car. I like the smell of the new car. So my mindset was, I'm gonna, we're going to drive it sparingly and keep that newness. That's my mindset. A couple weeks ago, I'm backing out of the driveway. Going to the Dunkin' Donut. And I misjudged. I scraped the side of the car. I jumped out of the car. I'm getting ready to go off. I mean, I'm getting ready to just, Pastor Jack, I'm in full transparency, full disclosure. I'm evangelically ticked off. I'm getting ready to go off. And immediately the Holy Spirit checked me. And he brought to my remembrance about not wanting me, not wanting me, not wanting my wife to drive that car on a regular basis because I didn't want her to mess it up. He did. Almost like the Lord was laughing at me. He brought that to my remembrance. And then the Holy Spirit said, what you going to do? And immediately, I started giving him praise for the car, praise for the accident, for the scrape. Because what he was letting me know was, you can't allow your joy to be surrendered to a material possession. So you have a choice. Well, stuff happens. You can react with the joy of the Lord. Or you can let how you feel dictate how you respond. Some of you this morning, you've been in situations where you've been frustrated, you've been irritated. You have not been joyful. And everybody in your house knows you haven't been joyful. Everybody who's been around you lately know that you have not been joyful. Because life's, life has been happening to you. Life happens. But what do you do? Pastor, how do we get our joy back? See, sometimes stuff can happen so fast and on such a regular basis that we get stuck. We get stuck. We, we, we get stuck where we don't know how to get back into the flow of the joy of the Lord. And so sometimes we only have a joy when we get a, a decent paycheck or we only have joy when we come to church or we only have joy when we hear some good news. But we got to have a joy that last pass stuff and, and, and people and material things. How do we get that joy back? 
the simple. You take it back. You simply open your mouth and you declare, <laughs> this is the day that the Lord has made. And I will rejoice and be glad in it. Come on, give him a praise, somebody. Come on, give him a praise. Take your joy back. And you do it by faith. You do it by faith. Joyful for the fact that you know what? I have breath. And my Bible tells me that everything that have breath, praise the Lord. Come on, stand to your feet and give him a praise. Come on, give him a praise. Come on, give him a praise. I know you might go home to a bad situation, but give him a praise. I know your finances may not be what you want them to be, but give him a praise. I know the marriage has been challenged, but give him a praise. I know your body and your health is being challenged, but give him a praise. Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. If you're saying this morning, I'm, I'm spiritually weak. I'm telling you this morning, you open your mouth and you give God some praise and you take back your joy. And you'll find yourself strengthened. You'll find yourself encouraged. Even if God don't stop the situation, God will say, even if I don't deliver you, I'm faithful enough to sustain you. Hallelujah. Father, we bless you. We honor you this morning. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. <laughs> and Father, we thank you for the joy of the Lord. Father, we know that joy is a weapon to the enemy. That joy protects us from oppression and depression. That joy protects us from, from sadness and frustration and irritation and we recognize Lord that joy is not based on what happens to us but it's based on who we know it's based on the understanding of who we know you are God and Father we know you to be the one who's able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we might ask or think. And for that, Father, alone we are full of joy. And we will declare every day that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, make a shout. Come on, make a shout. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, listen to me. If you're here this morning and you have not entered into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to know that you're missing out on the greatest act of joy ever in your life. If you're here this morning, you have never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Then you don't have that gift of joy that I'm talking about that comes from Galatians chapter 22. Because joy is part of the fruit of the Spirit. It is a gift. And every believer has the ability to overflow in that gift in their life to get the joy. I want to introduce you to Jesus Christ this morning. I want to connect you 
the true and only Savior. And so if you're here this morning, you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, but you say, Pastor Doug, I want to. I want to know Christ for myself. I want to be a Christian. I want to be born again. I want Christ in my life, and I want you to pray with me. If that's you this morning, I want you to repeat that to me. I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. If you're watching my way of media, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. And I promise you, if you, if you pray this from your heart, it will prove to be the best decision you ever made in your life. Because Jesus Christ in your life is a game changer. It changes everything. Everything changes for the better. So repeat after me. I'm going to ask you just to repeat after me. Say, Heavenly Father. I want everybody to repeat after me, if that's okay. Heavenly Father, I ask that you forgive me of all of my sins. I truly believe that Jesus Christ is your son who suffered on the cross and died. And on the third day, he was raised from the dead. And he's now seated at your right hand, praying for me that I might have life and have it more abundantly. Father, I'm asking for Jesus Christ to come into my life, to come into my heart, and to be my personal Lord and Savior. Now, Father, by faith, I believe that I am saved, that my name is now written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I thank you for this. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give him a praise. If you pray that prayer for the first time this morning in the sanctuary, this way better us this morning, we have some information for you that we wanted to share with you. If you pray that prayer for the first time, just wave at me so I can acknowledge you. If by media, if you pray that prayer for the first time, there's some information on the screen. We want you to contact us so we can celebrate with you. Amen? Amen. Well, are you ready to worship the Lord in your giving? Amen. Well, Elder Danita's coming. If you need a tithe or offering envelope, just raise your hand and the ushers will come and be more than happy to place one in your hands. Amen. Glory to God. His joy is our strength. Amen. Well, I'm just standing to testify of the goodness of the Lord. I, I am a tithe giver and I do, um, I do confess that. Amen? Amen? Amen. So I'm just reading now from Malachi. Very familiar scripture. Malachi chapter 3. But I'm starting here. It says, For I am the Lord and I do not change. At verse 6. For I am the Lord, and I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? Put on my glasses for this one. God says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and in offerings. You are cursed with the curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And prove me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven, and pour out for you such blessings that you will not be, there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed for you will be a delightful land 
says the Lord of hosts. Amen. Amen. Here at Harvest Rain, we confess and believe and decree that this is a church of 100% tithe givers. We still believe in tithing. For, the, for this word says that I am the Lord and I do not change. So some people say if tithing was in the Old Testament or whatever, God didn't change from testament to testament. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He is Jehovah Jireh, and he is in covenant with the tithe giver. So I just want to stand before you this morning and proclaim and declare and decree that God's word is true. I've been serving, what the old people say, I've been running for Jesus a long time. I've been serving the Lord a long time. I've been given my tithe a long time. I've been blessed and protected and provided for for a long time. And he is the same yesterday and forevermore. So I encourage you to, to give your tithe, to bring your tithe, to bring your offering into the storehouse. This is good ground. We do feed the needy. We do clothe the, the naked. We do take care of the babies. This is good ground. This is good soil to sow into. So I just encourage you now and, and, and bask in his blessings. Prove him, saith the Lord of hosts. I dare you to try God. We don't say that no more. We used to say that in the old sanctified church. I dare you to try God. Dare somebody to try him. Oh, that he will pour you out a blessing. He will provide for you financial favor. He will rebuke the devourer. Our finances will not be destroyed by circumstances. Our finances are not dependent upon the economy. God is our God and he's the creator of the whole universe. Amen and amen and and amen. amen. Have you prepared your tithe and offering? Come and give unto the house of God. Amen. Oh, what a blessing it is to honor the Lord with our tithe and our offering. Receive our worship, Father. Has everyone had a chance to give? Anybody having second thoughts and want to give some more? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, let us pray. Stretch your hands toward the tithe and offering. Father God, we bless you and we thank you, Lord God. We give you praise, honor, and glory for you are our God. And it is a privilege and an honor, Lord God, to worship you, Lord God, with our tithe and our offering. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, that this seed is sown into good ground, Lord God. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord God, now, Lord God, for returning it unto us a hundredfold, a thousandfold, Lord God. Do whatever you desire to do, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that every need of this house is met, Lord God, and all the needs of your people are met. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you are the God who is able to do abundantly, exceedingly, above those things which we could think or even ask of you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that you're in covenant with us. We thank you, Lord God, that we can prove you, Father God. We thank you now that the windows of heaven are open and we are wide open to receive, Lord God. Oh God, all the blessings that we have, Lord God, we declare over this house that the blessings shall flow into an overflow. And we just give you glory right now. We give you praise, Lord God. For all the things you desire to do in us, all the things you're doing in us, and all the things you will do, we give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. 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 amen.